Um, and, you know, I know there's a lot of folks here on the list from either sales enablement, heads of sales, heads of marketing, but you all, I'm sure, want to be inspired to, you know, how do you evolve your kickoffs to, to make them amazing for your team um, as your, your kickoffs are underway? So we want to share at least our um, view, having done many of them um, across dozens of them a year, you know, what we're seeing in the market and what we're seeing need to change in order to make that successful. So today we're going to walk through, you know, kind of planning for the SKOs and or kickoffs. Um, we're going to also go take about 15 minutes or so to also go into making an impact on site. And then also ended up with sharing some stories from the field that um, we've seen that are, have really worked or were kind of inspiring. So I'm Sherry Johnston. I head up the Revenue Academy here at Winning by Design. And I also am grateful to have Matt Dixon with me, who's the founder of DC, DCMI, DCM Insights and the author of Challenger Sale, as well as The Jolt Effect most recently. So welcome, Matt. Thank you so much for joining. Hey, Terry. Great to be with you, as always. Yeah. Great, great, good. Good stuff. Um, all right. Well, let's dive in. Um, lots of good, good kickoffs coming up across the globe. We've got January, October. Um, you know, a lot of things we are seeing in 2024 are changing that make it important to kind of evolve the way that we have thought about kickoffs before. Um, lots of us haven't had them or have had hybrid or remote ones the last few years. People are coming back on site. Um, and, and, you know, I think a lot of times that budget had not been used in the last couple of years. So there's more scrutiny than ever on the expense, which is often the research shows between two to four K per student uh, or per, per attendee of, on your go to market team. So really more pressure on the, the return on investment, um, more, more pressure to make the connections. Lots of us are not seeing each other very often in person. Um, and more, more reason to make sure when we are on site in person that that is even more, um, more important than ever that we are making that uh, bond. And, um, and then, you know, I'm seeing greater pressure to have a longer investment rather than the kickoff be just kind of one hit wonder of connection point. And then lastly, um, the, the other theme I'm seeing is, is uh, which has been a theme for, for a little while now, but more and more these um, these kickoffs are encompassing of the entire go-to-market team. So you'll know I'm trying to deliberately not use the word sales kickoff because they're typically now revenue kickoffs or just kickoffs so that we are um, incorporating all of those who are involved in creating revenue for the company. Matt, tell me about any others or, um, or any of those that speak to you based off of your experience and, and how these are evolving in the market. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's interesting. We've seen... Um... I think we've seen probably as much evolution in the way companies think about what used to be called the sales kickoff, now called the revenue kickoff or the commercial kickoff um, in the past uh, few years than we've ever seen, really. And I've been uh, traveling around the world for, it feels like a very long time, doing sales kickoffs, doing you know uh, revenue kickoffs, et cetera. And the formula didn't change a heck of a lot um, over time. You know, it, there was always the, there was like the obligatory components, which is, you know, the CEO or CFO kind of, here's how the company is doing. Let me, you know, I'll give you the broad strategy, broad brush strokes of the strategy, where we're going, where we've been, where we're going. Then there's the, the head of sale talking about, you know, how we did last year, what we're going to be focused on in the next year, obviously celebrating accomplishments, pointing out areas that need improvement. And then there was always the you know skill skill development component, right? So usually a big block of sales training, um, uh, bringing in a partner or doing it internally uh, to focus on on key sales skills. Um, and then there was always the obligatory kind of uh, product presentations, right? Which are you know here's the roadmap, here's what we launched, here's what we're excited about, here's what's coming, uh, et cetera. And those things were always live or typically live, but obviously COVID kind of blew that whole model up. Um, I think you're you're right, Sherry. There's um, one. I think now that companies, I think, have experienced, um, for better or worse, have experienced both uh, virtual and 
extended kickoffs, like you said. So it's not the one and done because you can't do a day long Zoom. And so it forces you to kind of chop it up. And I think people realize that there are real benefits to that, um, bringing the team together more often, whether it's live or virtual. Um, I think a lot of companies are actually questioning the effectiveness of jamming, you know, a couple thousand salespeople in a ballroom and teaching them a, a new sales approach or sales methodology or what have you, and instead thinking about maybe the that event is an opportunity to introduce new ideas and then have a learning plan and a journey that um, uh, that goes on well beyond uh, the sales kickoff or the revenue kickoff. Um, I think that the other the other theme you hit on, Terry, which I I've seen a lot of, is the actually that migration from sales kickoff to revenue kickoff, and I think that's I think that's here to stay. Um, I, I see, I see it done really well. I've seen it done not as well, but I, I have not seen very many organizations only bringing the sales team in. Um, uh, certainly I think in the kind of SaaS and recurring revenue space, it is almost the exception. If you would see a, a, in a rare exception that you'd see only a sales team coming together for a kickoff meeting today, it's, it's all of the supporting uh, team members, including product and in others from different parts of the organization that are even well beyond the commercial part of the organization to you know, say nothing of marketing and CS and customer service and, um, and, and solutions engineering and all those critical players. So I think that's a change that's here to stay. Um, and again, we can talk more about you know what we see companies doing well and hey, what they need to work on uh, to make all this stuff work. But I, I think the model's been blown up and I think there's a lot of experimentation going on now. And I think you hit on it, Terry. There's a lot of pressure right now to really demonstrate that ROI, especially in this environment. If we're going to make this big investment, whether it's extend, extended or it's a single event, you got to make sure it pays off. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Well, let's shift into um, the first section on sort of planning, which may not seem like the sexiest part. Um, and coaching yeah. purposes. <laughs> well, uh, is it definitely a key to um, to my heart in terms of what I've seen be really impactful for uh, our customers. Um, and I also want to throw out there, you know, Matt and I've seen a lot in the market, but we want you guys, I think sharing amongst each other is going to be just as important as us sharing our experience. So we'd love cameras on, love you to share in the chat. So please be with us and, and uh, you know, help also contribute as you have ideas. Don't be shy about just sharing them in chat or um, or speaking up with any questions throughout. So um, I will start, though, with a couple of, you know, how... Um, you know, three three areas that I've seen really uh, important in the planning process is, you know, one, obviously a timeline, um, more, especially if you're doing a whole go-to-market team kickoff, um, ensuring that you have, you know, at least a three-month chunk to do your uh, things like gathering outside speakers, um, the research needed, and et cetera, is, is really critical. Um, and then actually conducting the research, um, having ensuring that you have field surveys, um, stakeholder interviews. And then the last one third is just having some outside voices. Uh, the more I see echo chambers of, of just internal teams, product updates, uh, the less impactful I see when they, there's not that sort of outside voice. Um, that's a lot to unpack. So the one that I wanted to kind of really double click into from my perspective is, is the research piece. And, you know, Matt, you and I have partnered on, on quite a few uh, customer engagements. And one of the things that I think is, um, had been really powerful is really changing the narrative from, oh, hey, what, what do we as the company want to tell the go-to-market team versus let's hear from the go-to-market team and hear what tools and resources we they need to yeah. meet all these objectives that we have um, uncovered. And that's a very chain, you know, a huge shift in, in how you approach the agenda and the content of really being a uh, go-to-market team first. Yeah. And one thing when we conduct those with you, a lot of times what we hear is from the the go to market team is one of their biggest challenges is overcoming indecision in the buying process and getting stuck. Yep. So that's where you know your our partnership with you has been so impo um, impactful. And maybe you can kind of double click on you know your experience in in that uh, that research phase and 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 how um, obviously you did a lot of research to come up with with yeah. why the topic is uh, is is resonating as well. I, you know, it's, it's interesting that I think research, uh, this is a, you know, um, I love that as a, as a theme and, uh, a, you know, 
a pivot point or a change that we've seen in the way that these events are run. Um, uh, on the one hand, I, I think you're exactly right that I've seen a shift from top down, here's what we want you to do, here's what we say, here are the skills we think, we think are important for you to have, you know, here's the talk track, here are the product features we want to talk about, the more, what do you need help with? And some of that is is um, organically derived from the sales team, of course, through the research you're talking about, Jerry, but also from customers, right? And, uh, and going out and understanding where are we, where are we hitting the mark with our customers? Where are we falling short? And having a very kind of uh, clear-eyed view about, yeah, we're great at some stuff, but let's make no mistake, we really need to improve on X, Y, and Z. And then focusing um, skill development sessions, time spent, you know, team time spent in those meetings on those areas. I think it's, you know, this is something that I L and D professionals have said for a very long time, which is, you know, if you if you see yourself in what's being taught and you see that opportunity personally, it's going to stick a lot better. And I think it's the same can be said of a revenue kickoff. If it's grounded in research and data that we know because we've spoken to hundreds of customers or we've surveyed the sales team or we've you know, uh, done market research, and we know that these are white space or these are these are deficiencies that we have in the organization. And this event is focused on closing those gaps, so we can really accelerate into the coming year. I just think it sticks a lot more than if it's just some, hey, we got it together in a conference room, and we thought that this would be a good thing for the rest to go and teach people. I, you said, uh, sorry, you know, just if we think about the um, the jolt effect, I, this is it's interesting to me because. I, and you know this because we've known each other for a while now, uh, working together, our firms and, and partnering on uh, some, some of this uh, enabling the jolt effect kind of concepts with organizations. But I've always, you know, I personally find, um, is because I, I come from a different perspective, I've, one of my biggest misgivings or frustrations, I think, in the revenue space broadly is how much personal opinion is baked into um what we do, uh, what we tell people to do, themes we conjure up, stuff we talk about at revenue kickoffs versus having it grounded in data and research. And I'm, I'm asked oftentimes like, hey, you know, we're looking for a motivational speaker. And I say, look, there's lots of people who can motivate your team. And it's very rah, rah. And it can be exciting, get out of chairs or dance and walk in hot coals across the stage, all that good stuff. But, but give your sales people and give your revenue team some credit. These are very smart people. They want you to use um, insight and research to push their thinking, right? And so you want them leaving saying, boy, I didn't know that already. Or not, I mean, the last thing you want is an eye roll, like, oh, here we go again, the hot cool walking exercise, you know, or the trust falls or what have you. I'm not saying that stuff, it doesn't have its place, but I'm saying like, I think that I'm seeing a secular trend toward revenue organizations raising the bar in terms of grounding their agenda and what they're talking about in data, exactly to your point. What, are, what did you say you need help with? What do our customers say we need, we need to improve on, um, as well as uh, bringing content to the event that is also grounded in research and data. And just, it pushes the team to think differently. It pushes them a bit outside their comfort zone. Those are the, the that's the feedback I get from teams where they're like, wow, that was, that felt like I was like back in like business school or whatever. Like I'm, uh, you know, it's research, it's data, it's science, and it's forcing me to be introspective and think how I can improve my own sales game or my own CF game, right? Versus like being told some stuff that I kind of already knew and it was just said very loudly and, you know, <laughs> flamboyantly from stage. Again, it's fine. It's entertaining. It's just not, it's not giving your salespeople enough credit or your commercial team enough credit, I don't think. So I do think that that research trend is very much another one, uh, I'm sure that's here to say. Yeah, I, I think that's an important point. Like, well, it's grounded in what is going to make the greatest impact based off of our research. Uh, again, given that real emphasis on ROI, there's a lot of expense versus just the loudest voice in the room and, you know, who no. wants to give a session on on um, on something. So, yeah, the one hit wonder of, of hey, it, it might be entertaining for an hour versus what is really going to make an impact um, long term. I love that. So um, I'm going to, you know, I'd love to another audience question. I did a little bit of research on. You know, speaking of which around audience engagement, obviously the message is important, topics are important, um, but what is, you know, Sloan and Megan, I'm going to come to you, uh, I'm going to give you the heads up on this, but so a question for the audience and anyone who wants to pop into to chat or, or on audio, but, you know, you, last time you were at a kickoff and you were an audience member, 
what were some of the uh, what was some of the reasons you checked out the most? What was the number one reason that you felt disengaged or that it wasn't really resonating with you? What, what is there any one in particular? And maybe uh, Sloan, I'll I'll uh, see if you have a take a shot at it. Uh, I'm happy to to uh, chime in. Although I'll tell you that even though I'm in a sales leadership role, I actually have not sat in on too many sales kickoffs. I've led like portions of them, um, but my role is sort of like extremely new, um, <laughs> moving into kind of a different area than I was in before. Um, what I would say, I think just in general, when things aren't super relevant to you, but even if they're relevant to you, but not interesting or fun, and if you've been sitting there for a few hours, like there's only so much attention that any human being has, so <laughs> you have to keep it interesting. Uh, right. Otherwise, especially now, like we're all used to our phones and having lots and lots and lots of distractions and constant entertainment. So I think it, it's harder than ever to keep people's attention. Yeah. Can I, can I say, can I give a tactical piece of advice? So they, do you know the Absolutely. hardest, mo the worst moment in revenue kickoffs, I think, is after the break and trying to get everyone back into the, <laughs> into the room, right? To, to sit down and do the next speakers up and now we're running long. And, and it, it's so interesting to me because I think there's one of the, the additional resets. We're talking all about these resets that have happened in the, in the world of revenue kickoffs. I think one of them is just the power of connection and being with your team. Um, and I mean, the number of when I would, got back out on the road, uh, as people started bringing their teams back together, I mean, I had this talk track, which I think we went on for about a year, which was, I know this is the first team that met, a time that many of you have ever met each other, you know, or it was the first time you've been together in three years. And I think that's another thing that's not going away is the power of bringing the team together. Um, it fosters those uh, those type bonds. You know, it, the research is very clear. When you have good friends at work, you're much more likely to to want to stay with your current employer. Those friendships get formed at events like this. Um, it leads to collaborative opportunities and, and work on on pursuits together and deals. Uh, and so it's really important. My piece of tactical advice, a long way to way to say, is try to make your breaks longer than five minutes. So I, I actually like when companies do like a half an hour break. Give people time. They're going to get out there. Check your email, use the facilities, grab a coffee, connect with your colleagues, take your time and then come back in. But we are starting in 30 minutes, you know, but I see too many companies that they try to break it up after like five minutes and, and the team's still like, you know, they're hugging and they're getting back together. It's like, all right, get back in your seat, you know? Yeah, that's great advice. <laughs> yeah, give them a little more time. How about you, Megan? Any, uh, any things that, that have made you check out? Um just any like extreme monologues mm. you know where you just don't feel like you're going along for the journey so yeah i would say extreme monologues awesome well um you i did sure, sure, can i say can i get off yeah, a checkout yeah, yeah. point yeah. you know this is this is hard for me to say because i'm a product guy at heart but the product presentation oh the product presentations are the worst like hands down the worst part of any revenue kickoff is when the product people get up and start groaning on and on about the roadmap and the features and the fees and speeds it just we've got to talk about it again it's got to be grounded in research we've heard this from customers we've seen this in the marketplace our market research says that that's why we are focused on that but it's also good to be positioned in a way that you know what's in it for this for the salesperson or for the tf manager or for the the solutions engineer in the audience, like why should you care? And um, it just it it gets to the to the point that was just made. It really starts to go into this, this droning monologue, and it's more than just they need they need you know speaking coaching. It's just the content of it is just not it's just not resonating. That is the moment in every revenue kickoff. I see people start to pick up their phones and they start you know checking the news and you know texting their friends and things like that. They just start tuning out. No, it's, I'm glad you brought that up, Matt. I have my own um, shame story about that. My, our last kickoff in Park City, uh, I I run the Revenue Academy, so of course I'm like, hey, I want to I want to tell you guys all about our new courses. Like I built you a calculator. We've got all this new material. Where's my Where's my agenda item? And you know, they politely were like, well, you know, the team really is eager to hear this, this, and this, and that doesn't fit in. And I think it was an important lesson for me that 
as a product person or, or uh, you know, anyone who has a, a potential um, thing that is important to share to the sales team, that you don't have to do it all at once. And sometimes yeah. certain topics are more important in person than not. And so, you know, I humbly accepted that mine was not the top uh, rated topic, uh, even though I, I always feel my courses are most important. But I hear that a lot with my customers too, that, you know, that we will review their agenda and hundred uh, percent that there's, there's uh, a lot of product updates. And I feel like there's people like me who have worked really hard to pro products for the team, but we just have to remember and, and push back on like uh, going back to that initial initial piece of let's make it about how to make the team successful and what they need versus what we want to push upon them. So, um, well, Megan and Sullivan, thank you for participating. You did a great job because the top, uh, some research done by the team, um, Stand and Deliver, which they the, do a lot of, a, uh, of, of uh, sessions world, worldwide or around the U.S. especially, the number one reason is relevance, which mm. Sloan, to, to summarize, you you touched on is, is you check out when it's not relevant to you. And and Megan, the, the second reason is information overload, which if I were to summarize yours was was uh, was in that. And, and Matt, you, you also double clicked into that with, with the uh, product feature sometimes being the, the piece that is information overload um, for sure. So, so try to, um, you know, that one key piece of, of really making sure that um, those two are um, covered in your, in your agenda, when you're looking in the planning process, hey, is this relevant? Hey, am I trying to jam too much in? And just remember that it's not the last time you get to talk to the salespeople. We can we can continue or the whole go-to-market team. You can continue mm -hmm. on um, content. So Matt, I I wanted to just touch on. Um, we touched a little bit on topics, but when we are doing that research, obviously yours is one that comes up really commonly. Um, these are five topics for winning by design that when we go into, hey, what is going to be really relevant for go to market teams that come up really commonly, they may not, they may be right or wrong for your team, you have to do your own research or, or, you know, make sure that that is being, um, that is that that insights are coming from your team specifically, but just to kind of inspire some topics that are are common, um, and this area is a little bit blurry, but we've got, uh, you know, really in ensuring a, a large or um, delighting your customers with a customer journey. So we call this one joy, really making those impactful moments across your go-to-market engagements, um, taking risk off the table, which um, which obviously is Matt's uh, based off of Matt's research and, and teams um, teams book and and content. And then aligning your team around a common language. Alignment is a huge one we get asked um, and, and comes out in our in our um, learner research. And then last is customer centric storytelling, which I will have to say is a bit evergreen. This one always comes up as a um, a key key one. You know, stories change every year. It it really helps make sure um, that that customer centricity is there, and also is a really great one for engaging the entire go to market team as well. Anything else you wanted to um, mention, Matt, on those topics or or how um, you know how how Jolt is is sort of you know I think more than ever you and I talked a lot about this, yeah. but I think one thing that has come up when when you even did the Jolt research, it came up as the top you know uh, overcoming indecision. But but now we hear it even move louder uh, in today's yeah. market of deals stalling. Um, you know just push deals being pushed. And so it's almost become even more common. I'd be actually interested to do it, see it again to see yeah. how prevalent it is. Yeah, it kind of uh, sure goes back to your point about make, you know, in this discussion we've been having about do your research, make sure that what you're talking about at the revenue kickoff is grounded, is is evidence-based in, in the sense that it's actually the stuff that the team needs, uh, that they need help with. It reflects what they're seeing in the market. It reflects what we're hearing from customers, et cetera. Um, and I, I find, you know, definitely we've seen since probably fall of last year that one of the big topics, and I think companies that do this really well, um, they're less worried about whether the theme this year is like ignite the fire or accelerate the rock, you know, launch the rocket ship or accelerate, you know, whatever it is, like we all got our, our themes, right, and our, our catchphrases. That's a little bit less what they're worried about, but what they're thinking about is um, how do I help people with the, the, 
the thing that's standing in their way right now. And certainly from uh, last fall in, in your right, I think it's a really uh, no pun intended, but this is accelerated as well, is the fact that the big problem that sellers are facing in the market and commercial teams are challenged by uh, is no decision losses and it's customer indecision, right? Um, what I find is I talk to teams uh, often and they'll, they'll tell us, you know, well, our big problem is demonstrating the ROI of our solution. So we're really going to focus in on um, how do we evidence the return on investment for buying our solution? How do we provide the proof points, the success story, the data, the calculators, you name it. And oftentimes we'll all um, respond with this, that, you know, that's all well and good, but have you thought about why people are pressing you for that? Um, what's actually going on? Uh, is it that they don't believe your ROI or they don't feel like there's a, a robust enough set of data or your competitors are providing a clearer uh, line of sight into ROI? And, and where we eventually get to is that there's actually something else going on that's actually driving that focus. It's not that you didn't evidence ROI in the past, it's that your customers are worried about being on the hook for in spending a lot of money or advocating for a purchase that doesn't pay off. And in good times, that's, you know, that's just egg on your face. In this environment, that means getting you're getting fired, right? Because nobody has any tolerance right now for, you know, big purchases, you know, shelfware, stuff that doesn't get used, stuff that doesn't return uh, its intended benefits. And so that's why customers are really pressing salespeople on this right now. And so there's a little bit of this ROI edge fake, I feel like, going on in the market. But certainly, I think when organizations say, look, we looked at the data, we talked to the sales team, and one of the things we're going to be focusing on at this sales kickoff is, um, or revenue kickoff, is helping you avoid no decision losses or helping you get customers off the fence or helping you navigate this land of indecision. Because we have a lot of people who say yes to us. They want our solution. We've been down selected. We're, if they do business with anybody, they're choosing us. And then they go stuff or they go radio silent or, or what have you. And I think when you can uh, position your revenue kickoff around a solution to a very specific problem um, or a very uh, specific opportunity, um, I think that's what creates the, the stickiness. That's where people lean in. They say, oh, wow, they heard us. They understand what life is like in my shoes right now. And the rest of this event is going to be focused on helping me navigate through this and come out on the other end successfully. And we've all got to do it because the success of the organization uh, rides on that. So, um, yeah, we've we've absolutely seen an uptick in interest around um, indecision, deal stallouts, ghosting, radio silence. You know, pick your uh, customers on the fence, having them hung. Pick your your metaphor, your um, your language there. But there's definitely been an uptick in that. I mean, when we wrote the Jolt Effect, we found that uh, 40 to 60 percent of the average salesperson's qualified pipeline will ultimately be lost to no decision. That number, I think, that was in the summer of last year. I think that number is probably like 70 to 80 percent for the, especially in staff and recurring revenue, where there's just a ton of this going on right now. And that is a really, really vexing problem for salespeople to walk in to do a meeting with somebody or, or you know, demos, pilots, uh, team calls, and have the customer say, yes, we want to do business with you. You've clearly differentiated from the competitors. You've proved to us what we're doing today is not good enough. You've shown us that solving this is an urgent priority for our business. You've shown us that working with you would make things dramatically better for our organization. And then they ghost you. What's a salesperson to do? And, and again, salespeople have grown up in this world believing, well, it just must be that they're still comfortable with their status quo. So I'm going to go, as, as you know very well from the research, I'm going to go dial up the FOMO, right? I'm going to dangle that 10% discount in front of them. I'm going to create the burning platform and create the FUD, uh, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt with that customer. And as the research shows, those things actually can make the situation much worse and almost guarantee that the deal will be lost in no decision. So, so again, I, I think where you really um, where you really kind of spark that, that rethink uh, amongst your uh, commercial team is where you can come and say, we heard you. The data says very clearly this is our problem. Our customers say this is the biggest opportunity we have, the biggest gap we have to close. Um, so we're going to focus on that. And I'm going to give you a set of actionable skills that you can actually put into play like Monday morning after the event and start, start having different kinds of conversations with your, your prospects and customers and getting some of the deals moving forward. Like if you can do that, that, that is huge ROI uh, for sales stuff. And that's just indecision with one example, I think is a very timely issue. Um, but at any given point of time, you could take another issue. It might be like uh, negotiation or navigating through procurement or, or working RFPs or what have you? There's there's so many topics you could pick, but that idea of we heard you, 
We're bringing data and evidence and research to bear. And then we're going to teach you how to do this differently. And then you're away you go, right? That is a very powerful sales kickoff. A hundred percent. Yeah. I think part, a lot of the, the pain points is actually removing things from the agenda and that's the hardest yeah. versus, uh, versus coming up with an agenda. And I can't emphasize enough what you were saying around, you know, honing in on oftentimes there are several highlighted pain points, whether it be overcoming indecision, struggling with uh, outbound prospecting, um, yeah. customer onboarding, right? All of these things can be hot points, but, it, you know, really to show, like you mentioned, honing in on that skill, covering it, providing ongoing coaching and reinforcement, let's start somewhere. Like, let's pick what, what is going to make the largest impact for us and be the most, um, the most relevant for our team. You're, you're hundred percent right. That that is the hardest choice is across all of the things you could talk about. What is the, what is the big, the most important lever to pull right now? And then deciding that we're going to focus almost exclusively on that. And we're going to leave all the other stuff for later. You know, um, I, uh, I think it's, it's like, this, the sports coaching metaphor can be a good one here, you know, whether you're, a, you know, um, you're a marathon runner, you're a golfer, whatever, your coach is never going to give you a thousand things you need to think about. Like your golf, your, your swing coach is not going to give you 20 swing thoughts. They're going to say, you need to work on this across the next few weeks. All I want you doing is that, just think about that. And I think that's kind of the mindset we have to have when it comes to revenue kickoffs is what is the thing, the one thing we want people to get focused on. So they get really good at that one thing. But that requires that revenue leaders understand and have the data to say that is the problem right now. Whether it's, you know, our cold outreach efforts are falling flat, as you said, Terry, or whether it's deals are falling out and, and you were getting a lot of yet attempt, but we're not getting a lot of signatures. So we're falling victim to this indecision. Or it might be we're just getting killed in RFPs or by procurement. There's a ton of price pressure and we can't defend, you know, protect margin on our deals. We got to know that's the thing we're looking to solve this year and then focus the event on that. Yeah, hundred percent, and uh, really agree around it. It really, you know, a lot of times I, I do hear in our kickoffs that you know a topic may have already been covered. Maybe they have understood, they've read your book, they mm -hmm. understand overcoming indecision, but practicing it and coaching it and refining your talent on it is is going to be so much more impactful. I I, I love the sports analogies as well. So I, I I always use my my favorite in the Warriors of you know Steph Curry doesn't stop shooting the basketball just because he's really good at shooting. Uh, he's continually refining his craft and and that's being so important in um in in this space as well. Um, so I want to drink my own champagne, so to speak. And, you know, before this session, I reached out to about 20% of you or so a handful of you and, and, you know, asked you what, what's, Hey, what's top of mind? What do you want to make sure Matt and I cover and, and, uh, share some of our experience on. And so Matt, we got a, a, a request, you know, there, there's, and I think this one's a great one because I believe a lot of people are experiencing this and I didn't even touch on it in, um, things that are changing, but, you know, how do we, how do you support a kickoff that involves um, a organization that is undergoing a massive amount of change? Mm -hmm. And, um, and how do we make sure that um, with that complexity, whether it be new leadership, um, and, you know, I thought I would share a particular story of a client that we uh, supported that was going through a lot of change, and then would love to hear your point of view and, and anyone else who has um ha, has experience at this to make sure um make sure we give some some tips here but um yeah we did a um a kickoff a, a whole go to market team to kick off for a security company in the bay area they um you know had the advantage of, of growing quite quickly they were doing very well um but they did have a lot of change they had a new cro uh they had a new uh, primary investor, which was a huge in their their particular case, a, a large change, um, and then also they were they had shifted year over year to where their their main uh, revenue was coming from a new segment. Uh, it was no longer the segments that were resonating before, and they they shifted. So there was a lot of change. And, um, you know, I, I loved how you shared the product example because when I we started to partner with them. 
that was the agenda was was literally a an entire uh, two days of, of product updates from various departments around features. Um, and we you know had to really lean into them of, of it, it's difficult when there's what my experience was was for the folks planning the kickoff because there was so much change, it was very difficult to get alignment. So my advice and the thing that really worked well for the security company was going back to the to the actual go to market team and saying, hey, we put in front of them really aggressive targets for the next year. We are asking you to go after a new segment. What do you need to be successful? And that way it changed the narrative to where they didn't have a kickoff that was, um, we, we really revolutionized the, the kickoff and moved in, outs, in outside speakers. We added customers that were in that new segment so that the rest of the team could understand how to sell to this new segment. Um, and in that case, I really think it made a, a huge difference of, of really getting that voice of, of the actual mm -hmm. go-to-market team. I'm yeah. Curious yeah. You know, you know, a lot of what we were talking about before, you again, um, grab what to kill so as i've seen this a lot where um you're you're coming into a revenue kickoff and it's a newly merged uh entity um which of course entails a ton of change leadership change um you know uh, messaging changes solution the the change in the solution set change in segments that we're selling into uh etc and i think what i see most companies do is they try to use that as a drinking from the fire hose moment to say you folks don't know anything about this product set we just acquired. You folks don't know anything about the legacy. So we're going to just say, we're going to tell you as much as humanly possible. But, and then kind of, you know, here we go. Everyone's, everyone's now down the learning curve versus um, what we talked about before. And I think you just hit on again, Terry, which is we, um, we know that there's a lot for everybody. But if we thought about what are, the, what are the couple of things we really need to get smart on that coming out of this event together, we're going to need to be um, really sharp on. One might be getting uh, getting to know this new segment that we're selling into, or we don't have to know everything about this new um, capability set from this company we just acquired, but we do want to know these three things, you know, and that's going to be really important. Um, and if you master those things, then we'll tell you the next three things later, but let's get really focused on these three things about our, you know, our new part, our, our uh, newly acquired set of capabilities. So I think that's, um, again, you got to resist the urge of uh, like just filling the kitchen sink with more content and just talking at people and droning on and on because they will not absorb any of that information and think about, you know, have you listened to the sales team? Do you understand really what they need? And if you had 10 levers, what are the one or two that you are going to pull this year? And then the other eight or nine, you're going to wait till next year and just say, I just need the team to really focus on these two things. Um, you can't pull all 10. It's just, it's never going to work. I've seen it. I've seen companies try, they fail, they get a lot of eye rolls, they get a lot of like, oh, wow, that was a lot, you know, and it just goes in one ear and out the other. And then, then you're just cemented, uh, like no ROI because nobody learned anything and they just walked away feeling overwhelmed. Right. Um, I also will say around these change events, I think the companies that do it really well, don't try to kind of whitewash it or or pretend it's not happening. They kind of embrace it. They talk about it. Um, there's actually more time spent with leadership and like fireside chat, kind of open Q and A. Like, what are you guys worried about? Hit us with your questions, and um, and creating an environment where people feel comfortable asking tough questions of leadership around where we're going and how we're going to navigate this. How we're going to learn to shift from this segment to that new segment. Boy, it, it feels like having to relearn everything about what we do. And having that open dialogue um, so that it doesn't feel to the team like you're you're trying to sweep it under the rug and ignore some obvious challenges that are going on right now and big changes that everyone's grappling with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to shift gears. We talked a bit about um, the research content. Um, I want to shift gears to kind of the, I guess, icing on the cake of, you know, really making it impactful on site. Because uh, as much as we have great content, we all know that, you know, how do we make this memorable? How do we you know, you touched on a few things that are important too around building community, and that's been more important than ever with so little touch points for the team too. So with no particular order, um, I'm going to start sharing a few uh, memorable uh, ways that people have made it impactful on site, both um, from a content delivery standpoint, just 
kind of fun factor and whatnot. But um, yeah, anyone else that has ideas, please do share. I think this is a great one where we can all get inspired by different ways people have approached this. Um, but what I want to start off with kind of a basic one in that, you know, I think having done again, hundreds of these at the, in the history of winning by design and, and definitely dozens a year, we see the, the hands-on piece, the death, you know, trying to avoid the death by PowerPoint and moving to where uh, your go-to-market team can really get their hands dirty um, in their kickoff has, has really made a difference in making it more impactful and, red, and, uh, and relevant. So, um, you know, this is one, one where, you know, Matt, I know we partner with you to have actually like a workbook and exercises, okay. breakouts and 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 um, I'm you know curious also what you've seen in in the shift to to making this more um, more engagement on site. I you know the the picture is uh, great here. It's it's certainly one of the big criticisms I hear from uh, sales teams when you know oftentimes that um, when I'm brought in to to be a keynote speaker or to run a session at a revenue kickoff, um, companies will be kind enough to send me the feedback. And I get to see the feedback from across the entire event, what they liked, what they didn't like, how my session ranked, what I could have done differently, what resonated, what didn't, um, which is always great for me personally. But I, I think I've seen enough of these now that um, I start to pick up on themes like um, somebody please teach the product people, tell the product people we don't need to hear every, everything about like um, every bit about the product, but more what's in it for us. Um, I want more open dialogue with uh, customers and with our leadership so I can ask the tough questions and get, get you know, straight answers. Um, give me more time to connect with my colleagues. We haven't gotten together in, you know, two, three years. It is the, the one time per year where we'll actually get together. That's a really meaningful, important time for me to establish connections and get to know other people around the team. Um, and one of the big ones is uh, not enough time for breakouts, not enough time to apply what we're learning. It was just one thing after another. And I just never, you know, I never got to practice this stuff. Um, again, to stick with the, like, the golf instructor metaphor, you know, imagine just being told, like, when you do this and you're watching videos and so on and so forth, but you never actually get to try it and hit a couple of balls and see if it works, you know? So I, I think that's where things really stick. And, and those things can also serve double duty, of like having time with your colleagues and building some of those connections can be fun. Uh, it doesn't have to be drudgery, of course. We don't want it to be. Um, but uh, that application, remember the sales kickoff and the presentations are about um, uh, knowledge acquisition, right? You have speakers, you have people on stage, whether it's a CEO, it's a guest speaker, they're delivering content, you're acquiring that knowledge. But that stuff is all well and good. If they don't have time to apply that, uh, those skills and apply that knowledge, it's not going to stick, right? Uh, and so I think having lots of breakout time to talk about what you just heard on stage, how, you know, and, and let's have those tools and those workbooks and those discussion guides and facilitators that can get us from the big ideas on stage to the, how are we going to apply this in our sales motion or in the way we deliver value to customers or how we negotiate or how we manage an RFP and really start to apply the learnings. That's where that stuff sticks. Um, and by the way, it makes it, you're not just sitting in the audience listening to speaker after speaker after speaker, right? You gotta, you gotta mix it up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the, these pictures were actually from um, a customer that you'll be familiar with, Matt. This was from the uh, Point Click Care team out of Toronto. Oh, yeah. And I think this is a good example of um, another customer story that's different than what we've been talking about. We've been kind of focusing on you know larger kickoffs, but you mentioned it earlier that there is a trend also because COVID sort of forced this like more micro sessions that we are seeing that as well, where, where if you're not having a kickoff, you're you're really you know more doing these targeted learnings. So this was an example of that where um, they are a really amazing team. They honed in on um, how this was one of their team's biggest struggles, and um, and wanted to provide them the tools to to overcome it. So they had actually not gotten together as an AE team in years. Um, so they came together uh, to to do this workshop, but you know, as you and I've been talking about it, the the focus and 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 continual drum roll was so important to them. So I know you and I partnered, and you did a you did a kind of pre video to get people pumped specifically for the team, which was awesome. So we had some kind of pre planning. Of course, we did a lot of research on the team to understand their go to market and how that would be applicable to uh, to jolt, the Jolt Effect. 
And then of course we hosted the workshop on site, which, which is very engaging. And then they had also ongoing coaching. So I think this is kind of a, a great example of, hey, they're really focusing on one area that's super key to their team to show very measurable results um, and, and where they're gonna see, they're, they have seen much more impact than if they were to have picked five things and tried to yeah. change all at once. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's it was a great example um, uh, of, you know, focus, uh, knowledge acquisition, knowledge application or in skill development. And I, I'm sure that team, you know, you compare it with the team doing the average revenue kickoff left feeling like I learned something that was maybe different from what I thought, directly relevant to what I'm struggling with right now, where I need to improve. And it's going to be key for our organization to hit its goal. And I got a chance to try it. And now I'm going to go put it to work uh, out in the field. Absolutely. Well, great. Um, well, I'm going to shift to a couple other just kind of more fun factors. Um, I know that uh, another another team that I was um, that I worked with was uh, Workado, and um, you know one of their their kickoffs we worked with them on on storytelling, and I thought it was just kind of a clever, memorable uh, addition to their their kickoff that they they kind of came up with customer story playing cards that they gave everyone. So it, it added value, but also added some fun factor to um, ensuring that they had not only the content but but also the uh, the skills development to uh, to to pull it off. So that was a, a kind of fun one. Any others? Matt, that you've seen that are just kind of fun factors that stick out from that that you weren't expecting when you got on into a customer on site. Oh gosh, um, there's something been some uh, some crazy things that I've seen at uh, revenue kickoff. Um, I I love the you know what I like about this uh, Terry and I've seen this before is um, like there's always the swag right that we <laughs> the 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 stuff um, that you're you kind of step the shove into your roller bag when you're leaving the revenue kickoff. I like when it is reinforcing of, of what we're talking about, in this case, storytelling, right? So part of what I'm walking away with is those customer story playing cards is cool because it's something I look back, I have it on my desk, I put it on my desk or my bookshelf, um, and I, I look at it and it reminds me versus like the water bottle that but I don't remember what the theme was, don't remember what we're talking about, um, but something that if you can make that connection and make it, you know, have the fun factor too, I think it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you also mentioned earlier, which uh, which I think is key, is is you know the other piece piece to making it really impactful on site is is that that connection between the team mm -hmm. and and how why is so much more important than ever. Where we're all like, yes, we get to actually have wine together or whatnot. Yeah. Um, and so making time for that being more important than ever. I've, I've seen a kind of cool trend though, where uh, we're seeing more and more like less. Hey, nights out in Vegas uh, on the casino night, and you know, doing a um, a uh, fire pit at the beach, and having some marshmallows, and you know, kind of creating something mm -hmm. unique and memorable that that also might uh, create interactions that are unique and 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 stay with you. I'm curious yeah. if you've seen any others or have any other uh, have any other ones that uh, stick out in terms of connection across teams. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I've seen a lot over the past couple of years uh, has been uh, kind of charitable events that teams have done together and uh, uh, even doing it, like bringing in some competition, right, and some gamification. Uh, there was a an organization I spoke at their event recently and they had their teams, of, it was probably a thousand people there and they broke them up into cross-functional teams, right? So you had some people from sales, some people from enablement, some people from marketing, CS, um, sales engineering, et cetera, um, uh, yeah, on teams. So they, and they were purposely assigned to bring them from different geographies, different markets, different businesses. They didn't know each other, or most of them didn't know each other, right? So the part of it was getting to know each other, but they also, um, uh, they, they had a contest and actually the contest they were, I think they were, as I recall, uh, working with a charitable organization that donated school supplies to underprivileged kids. And so they were actually creating these backpacks um, with, you know, pencils and the the glue and the, you know, all the stuff that kids, you know, uh, uh, kindergartners and first graders need for uh, for school. And um, and they had this contest about um, how many of these they could actually pack. And they were like mountains of, of supplies, but um, getting together and doing that for a good cause, getting to know each other, and then also making a bit of a contest so that, you know, how many could you actually get um, 
backpacks because you can't load it up with supplies in X period of time uh, made it kind of a fun thing. So it was sort of a, a win-win in multiple dimensions. But I've seen that uh, a lot uh, lately. I've also seen, you know, you're right, like more of the unique kind of social things versus, you know, the awards dinner, you know, at the hotel, in the hotel ballroom or the night in the casino in Vegas or what have you. Um, I found that to be uh, a pretty pretty interesting. One one thing I've seen, another trend I've seen is when you do do have it on site, you have it in a big city like a Vegas, for instance, or New York, or where I'll be going in a couple of weeks, is having different leaders host different uh, dinners at different places, right? And then may, maybe having a few places that people meet up afterwards to get kind of reconvene. But I think taking a big group and kind of breaking into smaller groups and giving people a chance to get to know one, one another and ideally structuring those groups such that these are not people who knew each other before the dinner or the event, but they leave with with some you know bonds being established with their colleagues uh, is a pretty cool approach too. Yeah, absolutely. The smaller group connections, 100% seen that. You know, you're you're more likely to you know know how to ask someone for a favor or a referral or you know a resource yep. if you know who they are and you remember. Um, that you both won the, uh, the the backpack contest together. <laughs> and if you don't know who they are, so I love that. That's great. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, I'll keep sharing some stories um, as we go through this, but I'd love, you know, anyone who has questions that we didn't cover or you have ideas uh, along with you know, sharing how to make it more impactful on site stories, et cetera, feel free to um, pipe in the chat or, or unmute. Um, but yeah, you know, a couple of, you know, other things that I've seen be um, re really insightful is just, you know, also just this, the delivery quality, right, in terms of, you know, how do we, uh, even if we are doing sort of um, more, more PowerPoint-ish, there is going to be a uh, amount of content that needs to be communicated to your team, but, uh, you know, ensuring that it is really impactful, that there's, there's high-level, you um, uh, more more logistics of, of of kind of creating an, an engaging experience for your team to you know lots of times I've seen in in the field that they they're spent so much time on amazing content but making that memorable engaging delivery can be just as important as um, as the content itself so yeah thinking through some some of the tech that that might kind of help do that Jerry one other one of this just came to mind but I. Um... For some organizations that where they have uh, really big opinions, I've seen um, some uh, companies have success with more of the university type of uh, format, meaning they um, they go and they run sessions multiple times, but you as a participant get to choose your courses or your sessions that you're going to go to. This a company I did this for recently. I actually gave I think I gave the Jolt Effect presentation eight times over the course of two days, which is more than I'd ever uh, wanted to listen to myself talk <laughs> for two days, but it was uh, it was fun. And, and the base of the teams just rotated in. It was forty five minutes, fifteen minutes. Like the next group came in. This this company assigned their people because they wanted everyone to be able to go to every session. But they had um, I think twelve hundred people there, so they wanted to keep the rooms manageable and allow you know such that people would be comfortable asking questions and it was more interactive. Um, which is, you know, again, how do we take that big event and make it a little bit smaller and more manageable for folks? So they had success with that. But again, I've seen other companies say, hey, here's our curriculum and you can choose your own adventure. Now, there can be certain things like the CEO's presentation, the CRO's presentation, where we all get together in the ballroom. But then the rest of it is kind of, you know, their product sessions, the CF team is running something, marketing is running something. We got some sales trainers in, we got to get some guest speakers, we've got to cut, you know, some customers. Um, running a panel over here, and you can kind of choose where you want to go, um, which, you know, you got to be careful. You want it thematically to kind of tie together, but it does provide a lot of latitude for individuals to then choose the things they think are going to deliver the most value to them uh, personally. And um, what's interesting, what if you do this, I would say do everything like twice. So, so at least do like have a curriculum on day one and then redo it on day two, because what happens is People choose different adventures on day one and they get together that night and they say, oh, you didn't go to Sherry's session from Winning by Design. Oh, you've got to go to that tomorrow. Make sure you get a seat in that one because it was the, my favorite session of the day. And so you see you see a little bit of that buzz and then you want to give people a chance to catch it um, on, the, on day two if they miss it on day one. I love that. Give them a little uh, ownership over their own, yeah. so to speak. That's great. 
as long as it's not like college and they like skip classes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're almost out of time, but yeah, everyone that uh, participated, thank you so much for coming. You know, I want you guys to visualize. I know it seems like it's maybe a lot of these are usually in January, sometimes December it still seems far away, but I promise uh, the, the more time you fast, have, yeah. it, it, it's coming up very quickly. So just really imagine as you're flying back from the plane, from this event, like what you want people to be chatting about in Slack, you know, what you want it to feel like, what you want that water cooler, so to speak, talk to be to be like. And, and I hope we gave you some some ideas to make it more impactful so that, you know, that there's a, a big a, a positive sentiment and most importantly, uh, a lot of impact from the kickoff. Well, thank you, Matt, so much for joining and Thanks, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Take care.